Hi, I'm Matthew Matava, Chief of Sports Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. Today I'm going to be speaking to you on high tibial osteotomy to correct varus malalignment. I've divided this presentation into four distinct chapters. As an illustrated case example, let me present a 35-year-old carpenter with a five-year history of left anterior medial knee pain. He admits to a prior scope in high school for a football injury but could not specify the details. He now has activity-related swelling but no locking or catching. He has used Advil, ice, and off-the-shelf knee braces to no effect. He is very active. He likes to participate in CrossFit for physical activity, but he states it's very difficult to exercise. On physical examination, he's 6 feet 2 inches tall, 220 pounds, with a BMI of 28.2. He has varus alignment while standing without a thrust. He has laxative valgus stress at 30 degrees of flexion with a firm endpoint. His Lachman, anterior drawer, and pivot shift are all negative, as is his posterior drawer. He has a negative McMurray sign and negative Thessaly test, and he has full non tenor range motion to the hip. High tibial osteotomy, who, why, and when? The goal of a high tibial osteotomy is to have an active pain-free lifestyle despite a compromised medial knee compartment in order to, quote, buy time to a more definitive procedure. The predominant indications for symptomatic relief are active individuals in the third to fifth decade, lower limb varus malalignment, and those who have concordant medial knee symptoms. Secondary indications for a high tibial osteotomy are for joint protection. In this situation, there is no age limit. These are for patients who have various angulated knees with symptomatic ligament deficiency or those in which the medial compartment needs to be unloaded prior to a cartilaginous reconstruction. And like any indication in orthopedic surgery, patient education is imperative so that activity restrictions are identified and understood. In terms of risk factors for osteoarthritis of the knee, women outpace men in this condition. In terms of age, the incidence of osteoarthritis increases with age. And as a function of weight, those patients who are overweight or obese have a significantly higher incidence of osteoarthritis compared to those who are underweight or of normal body weight. Mechanical demand often exceeds joint tolerance in osteoarthritis. This can occur from either direct traumatic impact load, repetitive loading over time, obesity, meniscal and condyle damage, joint instability, joint malalignment, joint dysplasia, and joint de-innervation. The mechanism of cartilage degeneration in osteoarthritis results from mechanical overload that results in biochemical alterations leading to increased water content, decreased proteoglycan content, and disruption of the collagen network. This results in degradation of the material properties of the hyaline articular cartilage. In those patients with varus malalignment, there's a fourfold increased risk of medial OA progression. Those patients who have malalignment greater than five degrees have associated loss of function. And the severity of malalignment is associated with an increase in the magnitude of joint space loss. However, it's unclear what the association is between alignment and the natural history of osteoarthritis. In terms of athletic activity, there's an increased risk associated with prior joint injury. Joint injury primarily occurs from torsional and impact loading, especially in an athletic population. Altered proprioception occurs with age as well as injury, which can also contribute to cartilage degeneration. Repetitive loading alters the cartilage thickness and proteoglycan content, but is not associated with joint degeneration. There are also unknown genetic risk factors that are associated with development of osteoarthritis. There are several non-operative strategies that you can use in treating a patient who has medial compartment osteoarthritis of the knee. These include activity modification, trial of an axial alignment alteration, such as through a medial heel wedge, offset casting or unloader bracing, non anti-inflammatory medications, corticosteroid injections, viscous supplementation, weight loss, and aqua therapy. There are several indications for a high tibial osteotomy in the knee. Typically, this is in active patients who are less than 50 years of age with varus malalignment with a mechanical axis less than 50% of the tibial width. These patients should have mild to moderate medial compartment symptoms, unresponsive to conservative treatment, and partial thinness cartilage loss in the medial compartment. Now, a high tibial osteotomy can also be used to achieve normal limb alignment in those patients who are undergoing articular cartilage restoration, meniscal transplantation, or revision crucial reconstruction. A high tibial osteotomy may be done prior to or in conjunction with these other reconstructive procedures based on the comfort level of the surgeon. There are multiple contraindications to a high tibial osteotomy. Typically, physiologically older, more sedentary individuals are better served with a total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement. A body mass index greater than 30 is a relative contraindication. Patients who have advanced medial compartment arthrosis, inflammatory arthritis, flexion contracture, extension deficits, or tricompartment osteoarthritis should not undergo this procedure. There should be lateral compartment chondrosis less than grade two in order to perform this operation. And those patients who have non-concordant pain patterns, for example, predominantly patellofemoral pain, are better served with other procedures. 
cavitary defects, secondary to osteo necrosis, and adduction contractures of the hip are the final contraindications. Nicotine use is a relative contraindication, as is any other metabolic disease that may impair bone healing. Once it's determined that a high tibial osteotomy is appropriate for your patient, preoperative planning is imperative. Patient assessment for osteotomy include a history of their pain pattern, smoking history, any comorbidities, ligament stability, a gait assessment, radiographic evidence of appropriate cartilage wear, any evidence of prior conservative treatment, and the ability to file postoperative restrictions are imperative. Any condition affecting the life expectancy would also favor arthroplasty over a high tibial osteotomy. In terms of radiographic assessment, flexion PA weight-bearing views are obtained on all patients, as is a 30-degree lateral view and bilateral merchant views in order to assess all three compartments of the knee. A full-length weight-bearing x-ray from the hips to the ankles is also performed in order to assess the patient's mechanical axis. It's very important that a PA weight-bearing view be obtained. For example, on the left-hand side shows a weight-bearing AP view of the knee, which shows relatively good preservation of the medial compartment joint space. However, in the same patient, with a 40-degree PA weight-bearing view, the so-called Rosenberg view, you can see that the medial joint space is essentially completely gone on that right knee. This would be a contraindication to a high tibial osteotomy in this patient. There are sagittal plane considerations in addition to the coronal plane when assessing these patients radiographically. The HTO technique may actually affect the sagittal plane. For example, there is an increase in posterior tibial slope associated with an open wedge high tibial osteotomy, whereas a decrease in the posterior tibial slope has been seen with the closing wedge high tibial osteotomy. There are effects of increased posterior tibial slope. This has been correlated with an increase in anterior tibial translation, and greater than 10 degrees of posterior tibial slope has been shown to increase the load on the ACL. The increase in tibial slope reduces posterior tibial translation. Therefore, a closing wedge high tibial osteotomy is often indicated for a patient with medial osteoarthritis and PCL deficiency. Therefore, it's imperative that you assess the sagittal alignment in all patients considered for this procedure. It's important that the surgeon evaluates the patient's lower extremity axes when preoperatively planning for this operation. The anatomic axis goes from the center of the femoral shaft to the knee. The tibial anatomic axis goes from the center of the tibial plafond also to the knee. Whereas the mechanical axis of the lower extremity goes from the center of the femoral head to the center of the tibial plafond. This results in approximately six to seven degrees of valgus alignment in the average adult. However, with varus gonarthrosis, there's a marked alteration in medialization of the mechanical axis with an increase in the medial tibial angle. Dr. Frank Noyes has described the primary, double, and triple varus deformities. Primary varus deformity involves skeletal alignment in varus alone with or without medial arthrosis. The double varus knee has varus alignment, oftentimes lateral collateral ligament deficiency, and a varus thrust with ambulation. The triple varus knee is the most severe. These patients have varus skeletal malalignment, LCL or postlateral coronary deficiency, cruciate deficiency, and a significant varus thrust and recurvatum with ambulation. Now oftentimes lateral ligament reconstruction may be avoided in patients following a high tibial osteotomy once their skeletal alignment has been corrected. The technical goals of a high tibial osteotomy are relatively straightforward. For patients who have medial compartment osteoarthritis, the goal is to create a mechanical axis at the 62nd percentile as the medial tibial plateau is zero and the lateral tibial plateau is 100%. This will create an eight to 10 degree anatomic valgus alignment of the knee. For those with congenital varus, the goal is to create a mechanical axis at the 50th percentile without the need to create valgus alignment. Patients who are undergoing concurrent cartilage restoration procedures of the knee with malalignment often benefit from the analogy of the front end alignment of a car. If the tire of one side of the car is worn to one side because the front end is out of alignment, the mechanic would not merely replace just the tire. He or she would also fix the tire as well as the alignment. The same principle holds true when restoring the articular cartilage of the knee. To just address the articular cartilage without the alignment would doom the procedure to failure. The alpha angle is a line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the 62nd percentile of the tibial plateau on the femoral side and from the center of the tibial plafond to the 62nd percentile on the tibial side. This creates the angle of correction. The red line on the right x-ray represents the planned osteotomy sparing the lateral tibial cortex. A similar line is drawn up the tibial mechanical axis. The red line illustrates the planned osteotomy of the tibial metaphysis sparing the lateral tibial cortex. A similar length line is drawn up the tibial anatomic axis. This creates the angle of change in order to create the desired correction. In this situation, this becomes a simple trigonometric relationship. The tangent of the alpha angle equals B over A, whereas B equals the tangent of alpha times A, or the length of the osteotomy. In general, this relationship is one degree of correction for one millimeter. The surgical options for high tibial osteotomy 
can be generally categorized into either a lateral closing wedge or a medial opening wedge. With a lateral closing wedge osteotomy, a dual osteotomy is performed with a bone wedge removed. In this situation, the surgeon must disrupt the tibial-fibular relationship either by disrupting the joint itself or by performing a fibular osteotomy. Because of this, there is risk to the perineal nerve. However, a benefit of the lateral closing wedge osteotomy is that it will maintain the tibial slope. A medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy involves just a single osteotomy proximal to the tibial tubercle. It's imperative that the surgeon maintain the lateral hinge of the tibia in order to maintain correction. A medial opening wedge osteotomy does risk increasing the tibial slope, and there's also a risk of delayed union in compromised patients. There are several disadvantages to a lateral closing wedge osteotomy. As mentioned earlier, the perineal nerve is at risk while disrupting the tibial fibular joint. Small corrections are difficult, as are large corrections greater than 12 degrees, which may result in tibial shortening. There's more extensive dissection. A fibular osteotomy or tibial fibular joint disruption is necessary, and there are limited hardware options. It should also be kept in mind that surgeons are less familiar with the closing wedge option, given the popularity of the opening wedge techniques. There are several advantages to the medial opening wedge osteotomy compared to the closing wedge. A smaller incision is needed and there's less dissection. Both large and small corrections are possible. There's no need to disrupt the tibial fibular anatomy. Therefore, there's no risk to the common perineal nerve. The osteotomy can be adjusted in two planes, and this preserves bone stock for a future total knee arthroplasty. And fortunately, there are also multiple hardware options available. And because of surgeon familiarity, this is a significant advantage when compared to a lateral closing wedge osteotomy. Now here are three surgical options that can be considered for a medial opening wedge osteotomy. The traditional poodoo plate is shown on the left, the eye balance, and the contour lock. All three of these can be used for the same purposes of correction. The procedure starts with a knee arthroscopy in order to confirm the degree of medial compartment osteoarthritis, to debris any loose mechanical flaps, loose bodies, or chondral flaps, and to assess the lateral compartment. There should be less than grade two changes on the lateral side before this procedure is contemplated. A six centimeter incision between the tibial tubercle and the MCL is performed just distal to the joint line. The superficial medial collateral ligament is reflected posteriorly. It's important to identify the patellar tendon insertion because the osteotomy will be maintained above that location. When performing a medial opening wedge osteotomy, it's imperative that the osteotomy be directed at the tip of the fibula in order to maintain at least one centimeter of a lateral tibial hinge, two centimeters from the lateral joint line. This prevents iatrogenic fracture of the lateral tibial cortex or fracture propagation into the lateral compartment. When performing a medial opening wedge osteotomy, it's important that the osteotomy directed to the tip of the fibula in order to maintain a one centimeter lateral tibial cortical hinge, two centimeters from the lateral joint line. This prevents practical propagation through the lateral cortex or into the lateral compartment. Once the osteotomy is performed to a satisfactory degree, maintain that lateral hinge, a general valgus stress can be applied to the tibia. In this situation, you can see the osteotomy open up ever so slightly. This is the appropriate amount of laxity in order to perform the osteotomy with the wedged osteotome. When performing a medial opening wedge osteotomy, there is risk for inadvertently increasing the posterior tibial slope. Dr. Frank Noy showed us that the anterior aspect of the osteotomy should equal one half of the distance of the posterior aspect of the osteotomy in order to maintain this relationship. If both the anterior and posterior aspects of the osteotomy are the same, then this will increase the posterior tibial slope due to the triangular geometry of the tibia. Once the osteotomy is performed and the tines are maintained, the plate can be placed inside the osteotomy to the degree of grade correction based on preoperative imaging studies. Either bone graft or a tricalcium phosphate can be inserted into the osteotomy in order to enhance healing and to provide increased stability for weight bearing. Another option is the Contralock HTO system. This features a six hole titanium plate with improved rigidity and fixation, which makes it ideal for both primary as well as revision osteotomies. Both opening and closing wedge options are available, and these can occur with or without a wedge to maintain the osteotomy's opening. Locking screws are also used. Therefore, this procedure is ideal for revision surgery where stability and bone stock may be issues. With the eye balance surgical approach, a similar incision is made between the tibial tubercle and the anterior aspect of the medial coil ligament. The MCL is reflected posteriorly. When using the eye balance technique, the surgical incision is identical with a six centimeter incision from the medial joint line distally, halfway between the tibial tubercle and the anterior aspect of the superficial medial coil ligament. It's important that the MCL is reflected posteriorly in order to allow full exposure of the medial tibial cortex. The neurovascular shield is applied posterior of the tibia in order to build a cutting guide and to protect the posterior neurovascular structures as seen in the bottom right fluoroscopic image. Implant size can be verified fluoroscopically. The tibial width 
equals the width of the anterior and posterior aspects of the tibia divided by two. This will be used to calculate the size of the appropriate tibial implant for this particular patient. Once the appropriate sized implant is selected, the biplanar cutting guide is applied to the proximal tibia. Note in the upper right hand fluoroscopic image the small hole on the lateral tibial metaphysis. This represents the hole for the hinge pin and should be 1.25 times the distance from the lateral tibial cortex in order to avoid propagation of a fracture into the lateral compartment. The lower image shows in the sagittal plane how the hinge pin is parallel to the tibial plateau. The biomechanical advantage of the hinge pin is that it reduces lateral cortical stress from 10 to 50 percent in order to reduce the risk for iatrogenic fracture either through the lateral tibial cortex or into the lateral compartment. Besides preventing iatrogenic fracture, the hinge pin allows rotation and slope reproducibility. In the upper left hand figure, there is no hinge pin in place. Therefore, the saw could be directed at various angles, which risks increasing the posterior tibial slope. Whereas in the figure on the right, with the hinge pin in place, the saw can only be applied from a medial to a lateral direction. Therefore, the osteotomy is altered in the coronal plane, but not in the sagittal plane. The safety envelope allows the saw blade to be placed throughout the proximal tibia without risk to the neurovascular structures posteriorly. The eye balance implant is then inserted and held in place with multiple peak anchors. Just like any major orthopedic procedure, rehabilitation is imperative following this operation. DVT prophylaxis is recommended for four weeks. Postoperative bracing is also used. Early range of motion is established with a goal of zero to 135 degrees of flexion by six weeks. Patellar mobilization is key in order to prevent arthrofibrosis. Toe touch weight bearing is allowed with an opening wedge osteotomy, though some surgeons will also allow full weight bearing based on the size of the osteotomy and the degree of stability of the implants. Quadriceps and hamstring strengthening, as well as gluteal strengthening, are important in order to maintain the overall strength of the lower extremity. Return to heavy labor occurs between three and four months based on radiographic healing, knee range of motion, and patient symptoms. Light sports are recommended with the avoidance of repetitive high impact. And again, patient expectations must be addressed preoperatively. There are several potential complications of a high tibial osteotomy. Under and overcorrection are common if preoperative calculations are not done carefully. Delayed union and non-union can occur, especially in those patients who have compromised bone healing, such as with smoking or with diabetes. Arthrofibrosis, hardware failure, infection, venous thrombosis, and an alteration in the posterior tibial slope can occur. MCL laxity is a theoretical concern, but is extremely uncommon even though the MCL is reflected posteriorly in order to gain exposure to the proximal tibia. The perineal nerve injury is a risk, but only for the lateral closing wedge option. Compartment syndrome has to be considered, therefore some surgeons will perform a prophylactic fasciotomy. Neurovascular injury to the posterior neurovascular structures always must be a concern, therefore it's imperative that appropriate retraction be used irrespective of this osteotomy system that the surgeon chooses. And finally, patella baja can occur and this is most common with a medial opening wedge osteotomy. An intact cortical hinge is the primary determinant of postoperative stability. Therefore, if that lateral cortex is compromised, stabilization with either a staple or plate is mandatory in order to allow both the correction as well as stability to enhance healing. The survival rate for both an opening wedge and closing wedge osteotomy are relatively similar, with five-year survival rates between 70 and 97 percent, 10-year survivals between 77 and 85 percent, and 15-year survival around 68 to 69 percent. There's no difference in survival rates between opening and closing wedge options, and there's no difference in pain scores, lysome scores, or complications between the opening and closing wedge osteotomy based on large series of patients. In terms of performing a high tibial osteotomy and associated cartilage or cruciate reconstructive procedures, there's been satisfactory midterm survival rates in these patients. Satisfactory symptom relief and knee function found on HTO and ACL has been reported in a number of series. In terms of long-term knee symptoms and function, pain relief improvement is related to the length of the follow-up. Most patients return to low-impact sports in the short to midterm. There is considerable literature reporting both the short, mid, and long-term outcome following a high tibial osteotomy. Cartilage regeneration after a high tibial osteotomy has also been described. Young reported regeneration of cartilage in 92% of patients following an open wedge high tibial osteotomy. And cartilage regeneration was associated with clinical outcome. Kim showed the fiber cartilage proliferation following an open wedge osteotomy was associated with a lower BMI. And Kumagai reported that cartilage regeneration was associated with a lower BMI, more advanced degeneration, and greater overcorrection. 
However, there's no association between cartilage regeneration and age or gender. I've discussed multiple issues related to the performance of high tibial osteotomy. However, there are several key points. The innovative hinge pin provides stress relief in order to reduce lateral cortical fracture or fracture propagation into the lateral compartment. And the unique safety envelope protects the neurovascular structures posterior to the tibia. The low profile implant does not require removal and is ideal for 300 patients with decreased soft tissue coverage. The indications and contraindications are identical to the contour lock. A medial opening wedge osteotomy is favored over a lateral opening wedge osteotomy because of surgeon familiarity and the wide variety of implants that are available. The surgeon must assess the coronal and sagittal alignment and all patients who are going to undergo an osteotomy for isolated medial compartment osteoarthritis, meniscal or cartilage restoration, and revision crucial reconstruction. Factors that are imperative for a successful outcome include appropriate patient selection, correction calculation, and impeccable surgical technique. I would also recommend that you consider a stage procedure for either the double or triple varus knees, or if your comfort level with this operation is not such that you want to try to tackle both an osteotomy as well as a reconstructive procedure. However, as I emphasized before, patient expectation must be addressed preoperatively in order to have a successful long-term outcome. Thank you.